So, uh, I'm Noah Zilberman, University of Oxford, and today I'm going to talk about carbon aware networking. Uh, this is joint work with Eve, Yuri, Ajit, Don, Robert, and Rick, and I'm sure all of them will be happy also to discuss with you online afterwards. So, uh, when we are talking about a carbon footprint, we tend to think about bulk numbers, such as the carbon efficiency of a data center. But when uh, networked applications are considered, the problem is a lot more complex than that. So let's say that I want to see what is currently on hot carbon. So to see the program, obviously I'll take my uh, phone. From a phone, I'll connect to some sort of a base station. I'll route through multiple ISPs and multiple network devices until I'll get to the data center network where uh, the web server is hosted. My transaction will go through the NIC to a server and to the application. It will uh, obviously involve a CPU, storage, memory, and other overheads including power, cooling, and so on. Now, obviously, I also need to account for the response that goes back to me. So just taking a bulk number doesn't work here. And sometimes people tend to think that the network is negligible. So if Amazon takes, uh, consumes about 24 terawatt hour per year and Google more than 15 terawatt hour per year, then ISPs such as Telefonica and Vodafone consume less than six terawatt hour. However, the network is not negligible because we have a lot more ISPs than we have hyperscalers and these numbers become huge. Now to put things uh, further into context, uh, Telefonica consumes about 54 megawatt hour per petabyte. And that's after they reduced by 86% their uh, power consumption over the last six years. So we do have a real need here for carbon efficiency. And I'm going to touch on some of the challenges here, starting with the policy of defining metrics. First of all, what we need is to use standard metrics. Even as we were writing this paper, we kept debating what is the right metric here? Is it carbon efficiency? Is it carbon emissions? Is it carbon intensity? And unless there is a single agreed set of metrics, it will be hard to move forward. The second uh, thing that we need is a standard evaluation environment, which is something that Everyone that is familiar with the reproducibility crisis knows how important it is, but it's more than that. In network devices, we have a thousand and one knobs that can be configured. So we need to know when someone reports the carbon emissions of uh, the device, and yes, I, put, I picked a specific metric here. We need to know that they measured it exactly the same way as any other vendor. And we need to know these numbers under different loads because loads affect the carbon efficiency and the carbon emissions. Furthermore, we need measured results. It's not enough just to take the maximum number from the data sheet or the average number from the data sheets. We need to know what are the measured numbers. And in the paper, we discussed a few more uh, aspects that policy needs to define, such as avoiding double counting, trustworthy reporting, and I'll also touch next on real-time observability. Now, I'm moving for policy to discuss a bit more the technical challenges. Because when I'm uh, looking at uh, the network, and again, I'm going back to the example where I just looked up what's on the hot carbon website, I'm going through multiple administrative domains. I'm going through multiple types of devices from different vendors. And obviously my traffic is mixed with flows from many other users. So I need to be able to account to what is my contribution here, 
what are the applications that are more uh, harming carbon-wise, and I need to be able to separate it. And I need to be sensitive to load, because uh, as load changes, so does the power consumption and the gradient of the carbon intensity. All these means that I need to have real-time reporting of electricity consumption, of carbon intensity, and carbon intensity does change on minute scale and even sometimes second scale. And I need to be able to tie it back to the application. And all that in real time. There's no point looking at this uh, information at the end of the day and saying, okay, tomorrow I'll do that, because it will no longer be relevant. Now I'm going to talk now about a few directions for solutions. I'm not saying that we have all the solutions, far from that, but I'm going to go from the easy to the hard in how we can attend uh, to a carbon aware networking. So let's say that I want to find the most carbon efficient uh, route between myself and Eve. So, there are two potential routes, either through switches A, B, and E, or through switches A, C, D, and E. Which one should I pick? The first thing that we can do is have a sort of an energy rating. And I'm aware that there are already some sorts of reporting for uh, devices, but I'm talking about the standard energy rating, this kind of energy rating that your fridge has, it says, okay, I'm an A-star fridge. We need that for an A-star switch. So I can use in-network telemetry to collect the information about the energy rating of the devices. And let's say that I can pick here between a route that is A, C, D, and E and uses only A-rated devices, should I use it? Would it be better to go through two switches that have A rating than one switch that has B rating? Obviously, that's not enough. I need more than that. I need some sort of a weighted energy rating that will say, okay, I've got different uh, lengths of routes and I've got different ratings. I need to be able to compensate and find the best route. But it's still not easy. I need to consider a lot more than that because if everyone will pick the route that is the most carbon efficient, we'll have a congestion, we'll have load. So devices may be less carbon efficient. There's, that's what we mean by carbon efficiency gradient. We need to take care of multi-route optimizations and so on and so forth. And that brings me to carbon intelligent networking. So first of all, I'll start with routing. And what's the difference between carbon aware routing and carbon aware and carbon intelligent routing? So in carbon aware routing, I have some information about the carbon emissions. And I'm looking to minimize them while still applying standard routing practices. So that means that I have through telemetry the information that I just had about energy rating, and I'm finding the best uh, route according to that, and that's it, standard routing. In carbon intelligent routing, I also have information about the carbon emissions, but I'm taking different approaches to routing and to scheduling of data transfers. So for that, I need to set metrics such as I'm willing to pay a certain delay in order to get more carbon efficient routing. And I need to set a carbon footprint budget. And that's an example. We can play here with the metrics. But I'm having a set of metrics that I define for my routing purposes, and I use them for route optimization. So for example, if I'm looking at a DTN, delay tolerant networks, 
I can think about them becoming delay tolerant carbon bounded routing networks. Okay, so I am paying a certain delay. I have this allocation of buffering in advance. And I'm routing the packets when uh, there is excess renewable energy available. A more obvious example is a content distribution. Because already uh, content distribution, uh, content providers are distributing videos to caches at times that they are off peak to avoid uh, congestion. If they can optimize beyond congestion also for carbon efficiency and do it, uh, the content distribution where it's most carbon efficient, then there's a big gain here, especially if we consider the large amount of uh, traffic over the internet that is driven by a, a contrast distribution. But for that, what we need is also carbon intelligent network telemetry. That means that I need to be able to collect information from the network devices along the route. And specifically in the paper, we argue that we need to start by doing that within a single uh, AS, a single administrative domain that has knowledge about the devices uh, that they are running, that don't have a problem about sharing this information with other ASs. So starting small, starting with a single AS and collecting either information that is static, such as energy rating, but more importantly, dynamic information, information that may change uh, on the scale of minutes or seconds, such as are we using renewable energy? What is the carbon intensity right now? And we need to look on the platform power consumption. It's not enough to look just on uh, the power consumption of a single device. Uh, something like RAPL will not be sufficient here. We need to know also what is the overheads of the uh, DC DCs there, the power uh, uh, supplies. We need to take into account the cooling. We need to take into account the transceivers and so on. So we need the entire platforms power consumption. So how do I find the most carbon efficient route using carbon uh, intelligent routing? First of all, what I'd like to do is to schedule messages to the nodes when a carbon intensity is low. I'm using INT to collect information. And then when I want to route a packet, I'm sending packets through nodes that are green using renewable energy, have low carbon intensity, depending on the metrics that we set. And if router E in this example, is currently red, not uh, carbon efficient. What we'll do is delay the message until it becomes green and I can send the message to the destination. So in summary, networking needs to be carbon efficient. I believe that if you are here, you probably don't argue with that. Also, we need more visibility. We need visibility in the stack. We need visibility in the application, we need visibility in the, to the platforms, and we need it in real time. We need to set standard metrics and we need to have global standards, especially if we are thinking about working across multiple domains, we need to make sure that everyone is speaking the same language and agree to what needs to be shared and how it needs to be shared. And there are no uh, disagreements there. That's why we need the standards here. And Carbon intelligent routing is really the next big step to making networking green. And with that, I'm happy to take all questions. Uh, Andrew Chen, U Chicago. No, nice, nice talk and great to hear about people working on networking. This is a super hard problem. I'm going to ask a naive question because I don't actually know how this works. I'm wondering if there are examples of ISPs that have dynamic pricing for traffic or any other dynamic mechanisms that they reflect other than maybe latency. I don't know. I can say that one of the things that we have discussed when we started to work on that was actually uh, the 
energy problem that we have, especially in Europe at the moment, and the rising costs of energy, and whether ISPs will start actually to charge users differently based on the availability of energy. So there are considerations like that, but I don't know that I'm not aware of users being charged differently, not test home users at least. Hey, thanks Noah, uh, Simon Peter, UW. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on power proportionality of networks and switches, because I imagine that um, your so solution here is predicated on the fact that if I don't take a route, those switches on the route are not going to consume any energy um, it, it, or consume proportionally less energy to the to the proportion of traffic that goes to them. Um, are switches today power proportional? So it's a hard question because it depends which switch you are using and different switches will behave differently depending on the architecture. So drop some buzzwords. So if you have a PISA architecture and um, or RMT architecture, it will behave differently than a DRMT architecture that has many cores and accessing uh, the memory in different ways. So uh, it won't be exactly the same. You will have uh, some uh, power consumption as long as the device is working. And then the question will become, you know, how the slope looks like. And it doesn't look today as far as we discussed, so this is a collaboration with Intel, um, like on CPUs where it's enough to have a relatively low utilization and get almost a peak uh, power consumption. But uh, so again, it's not an easy question. That's why we need to know what is the gradient. Yeah, and it looks like there's going to be some work on it in a follow-up talk. <laughs> I just saw that popping up there. Thank you. I know uh, Lars Egger from NetApp, and I also share the IETF, which I want to pitch here for a second, because so the, the standards and metrics sort of reminds me a lot of, there's a lot of work that's been done over the decades on benchmarking of, of switches and routers, right? And there's IPPM, which is a working group for the metrics for benchmarking, and there's the benchmarking methodology working group. And there's a ton of operators that are basically defining these metrics and test approaches because they want to have a joint thing. And this looks exactly the same, it's just a toy different thing. So, I guess Eve is going to talk to us about that at the IETF, which I think fits very nicely with some yeah, ongoing yeah. stuff. The, the other thing is, I think it's exactly right that you're looking at intradomain, interdomain for no, intradomain first. Sorry, I'm totally jet lagged, because otherwise it's very hard, right? BGP is not really sort of the best protocol for this sort of stuff, and also um, we've had operators that wanted to exchange, for example, sort of congestion hotspot information, uh, and and it, that enables some very interesting attacks. And if you are sort of because you can now, you could economically attack an operator by making sure that your traffic like really hits the hotspots for them, right? It really makes them burn carbon, which is really terrible, right? But th there are these sort of considerations that you think about the app use too. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm Daniel from Duke University. Um, so I'm wondering what are the fundamental factors to determine the energy consumption of a switch? Uh, for example, is it the buffer size matters. Uh, like, Again? is is a packet buffer size matter? Does the packet buffer size matter? So I'm thinking about, it. let's say, if I want to optimize the energy consumption of a switch or determine the energy rating of a switch, right? Like, uh, should I think about uh, maybe I sh can try to develop some techniques to minimize the buffer size of a switch? Or sh um, also, I'm wondering whether the max rate of a switch matter. So um, a switch port, usually you can configure it as a 100G or 10G by providing some configuration. I'm wondering whether that also will change the energy consumption of the switch. Um, I'll try and answer all that. So first of all, buffer size obviously uh, is uh, translates to SRAM. SRAM takes power. The best places to look for that without disclosing any NDAs is actually in the uh, uh, RMT paper, fast forwarding paper, which has a breakdown there and some numbers that are quoted. Uh, but you know, you still also need functionality. Are you? It's more of a question of tables. I mean, how many uh, entries do you want to have? You know, MAC table. Are you willing to trade that for power efficiency? So that's one question. Uh, 
about uh, the uh, throughput through the switch, I'd actually look here on the packet rate rather than on the bandwidth because the core frequency of the device will dictate how many packets per second you can process per pipeline. So by at some point, you already have multiple pipelines in order to achieve even five billion packets per second. If you scale down the frequency, then uh, you do reduce the power consumption. But I would say here that switches, unlike CPUs, because they are not predictable, it's a lot harder to implement mechanisms such as DVFS. I'm familiar with efforts in industry to do things like that already going back 10 years at least, if not more. I think that there are already so some patents that, uh, that were published. But it's not easy because you don't know when packets will arrive, then how many packets will arrive. It's not like you are scheduling a task. But also you can say, okay, what about EEE and other efforts like that? So it all builds up on different layers, from the physical layer to the uh, you know, layer two and so on. And the software is important here as well. Do, do we have time? Okay, hi. Okay, hi, I'm Bilge from Meta. So my question is, so the carbon efficient routing seems like depends on um, where are the locations of the routers in the first place? So have you considered carbon efficient routing placement in your work? Or what are the uh, traditional um, reasons for routing, routing placement? And how does it affect the carbon efficient uh, routing? I'm not sure that I understand the question. But if, for example, I want to connect from here to my servers at Oxford, I must go from here to Oxford. I can't decide that all the routing remains in the US, obviously. So the, and there are questions here about routing that has to do whether, you know, if you go across multiple ISPs, whether there's hot potato uh, routing or not. Or someone just say, I want minimum energy here. I just give it to the next uh, service provider or not. So. Um, we have discussed that it's probably something for a longer discussion, but it can't decide that it all remains local. Thank you. Okay, okay and uh, 